Sayın Federasyon Başkanımız Erkan Yalçın, Sayın Yönetim Kurulu üyelerimiz, Sayın Federasyon Kurul üyelerimiz, Sayın Fina As Başkanımız Dale Neuberger, Sayın Fina eğitmenlerimizden Chris Martin ve siz değerli antrenörlerimiz. Hepiniz 2018 Koç Klinik İstanbul etkinliğimize hoş geldiniz. Sizleri tüm şehitlerimiz adına bir dakikalık saygı duruşu ve ardından İstiklal Marşı'nı davet ediyorum. Eğitim Kurulu Başkanımız Sayın Murat Özdoğan'ı konuşmasını yapmak üzere kürseye davet ediyorum. Merhaba herkese. Murat Özdoğan ismim. Eğitim Kurulu'nda görev yapıyorum federasyonun. Eğitim Kurulu olarak bir ön konuşma hazırlamamız istendi bizden. Ama biz bunu yapmadık. Onun yerine sizlere yazılmış bir mektupla geldik buraya. Mektup Avustralya'dan, Wayne Goldsmith'ten. İzninizle onu okuyorum. Türkiye'deki dostlarım ve meslektaşlarım merhaba. Hoş geldiniz demek büyük bir mutluluk benim için. Antrenörlük dünyadaki zorluğu en çok emek isteyen ama bir o kadar da karşılığını alabildiğiniz mesleklerden birisi. Bazı insanlar yol yapar, sürüş şeklinizi değiştirir. Ve mobilize olmanızı sağlar. Bazıları ev yapar. Yaşama şeklinizi değiştirir. Bazıları film yapar, kitap yazar, müzik besler ve eğlence şeklimizi yönlendirir. Topluma katkı sağlayan birçok meslek sayabiliriz. Ama antrenörlük farklı bir şey. Antrenörler farklı insanlar. Antrenörler hayatını değiştirir. insanların. Davranış şeklimiz, kullandığımız kelimeler, işimizde gösterdiğimiz emek... Sporcularımıza ilham kaynağı olur. Antrenör olarak sadece antrenörünüzü yaptığımız sporcuların değil, onların ailelerinin hayatlarında da bir fark yaratma imkanımız vardır. Türkiye'de hemen her çocuğa yüzüme dersi vererek bu sayede bir gün belki de hayatlarını kurtaracak bir beceriyi onlara kazandırma şansımız var. Türkiye'deki, çok özür dilerim ama biz antrenörlerin işi sadece bu değil. Biz antrenörünü yaptığımız her sporcuya yaşam boyu kullanacakları bir takım değerleri aşılarken 
onların sağlıklı bir birey olarak ihtiyaç duyacakları bilgi ve beceriyi kazandırıyor ve onları hayata hazırlıyoruz. İster tecrübeli bir antrenör olun, isterseniz mesleki hayatınızın başında olun. Öğrenmenin sürekli olduğu bu meslekte araştırın, dinleyin ve diğer antrenörlerin tecrübelerinden faydalanın. Dünyada böyle bir meslek daha yok. Başka hiçbir meslek günün sonunda yüzücünüzle bir gülümseme ile koltuğa oturtup evet ben bugün bir hayat değiştirin dedirtmez. Antrenörünüzün keyfini çıkartın, elinizden gelenin en iyisini yapın ve fark yaratın. Beyin Goldsmith. Kendisiyle 5 sene önce çalışma imkanım oldu. Ee, bu Koç Günlük'ten bahsettik ve sizler için bir şeyler karalar mı dedik. Çok iyi bir mentor kendisi. Ee, bütün branşlarda zaten çalışıyor. Umarım beğenmişsinizdir. Ee, bu arada bir ricam olacak sizden. Biz eğitim kurulu olarak bu organizasyonu yapmış görünüyoruz. Ama birazcık hazıra konduk diye düşünüyorum. Arkada çok güçlü bir ekip çalıştı ve çok çalıştı. İzninizle o isimleri okumak istiyorum. Emre Kara, Fatih Kanvas, Handan Kortak, Bircan Demirbaş, Emre Erciyes, Şeyma Üskan, Muharrem Öznalbant, Hakan Eskioğlu, Hüseyin Özer ve Yasin Şahin. Zahmet olmazsa ufak bir alkış rica edeceğim bunlar için. Çok teşekkür ediyorum. Değerli misafirlerimiz, şimdi Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonu Başkanımız Sayın Erkan Yalçın'ı kürsüye davet ediyorum. Değerli katılımcılar, değerli antrenörler, Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonu ev sahipliğinde FINA desteğiyle organize ettiğimiz FINA Koç Klinik 2018'e hepiniz hoş geldiniz, sefalar getirdiniz. Böylesine kalabalık bir katılım olması bizleri çok memnun etti. Türk yüzmesini geliştirmek için özveriyle çalıştığımızı bilmenizi istiyorum. Siz antrenörlerin ve kulüplerimizin de çabalarını çok yakından takip ediyorum. Daha başarılı olacağınıza inancım sonsuz ve tamdır. Sizlerin daha başarılı olması için elimizden ne geliyorsa yapacağımızdan en ufak bir şüpheniz olmasın. Sizlerin huzurunda bu organizasyonda emeği geçen FINA Başkan Yardımcısı Sayın Mıstır Değil'e ve değerli hocamız Kırırs Martin'e ve Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonları çalışanlarına teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Öncelikle belirtmek isterim ki Zeytin Dalı Harekatı'nı Afrin'de devam ettiren ve ülkemizin bekasını sağlamak için savaşan Muzaffer ordumuzu bu uğurda şehadet şerbeti içen Mehmetçiğimizi bütün kalbi duygularla yad ediyorum. Şehadet nasip işidir diye yola çıkıp ya şehit ya gazi oluruz diye sefere çıkıp adaleti, zalime ölüm, mazluma umut dağıtmakla tesis eden Vatanın mukaddes evlatlarına buradan bin defa selam olsun diyorum. Sefer bizden, zafer Allah'tan diyen koca yürekli yiğitler, İmam-ı Gazali Hazretlerinin de dediği gibi, dua ordusu gaza ordusunun kardeşidir. Gecelerimiz sizlere ettiğimiz dualarla kuşandı. Rabbim zalimin karşısında, hainin karşısında, sizi mahcup etmesin. Rabbim seferinizi zaferle taşlandırsın inşallah. Bizlere daha güvenli bir ülkede ve coğrafyada yaşamak için ordumuzun liderimiz Cumhurbaşkanımız Sayın Recep Tayyip Erdoğan ve devlet büyüklerimizin göstermiş olduğu mücadeleyi ve eşsiz gayreti canı gönülden destekliyor ve vazife vuku bulursa Cephede bir nefer olmaktan da geri durmayacağımızı beyan etmek istiyorum. Ülkemizin geçmekte olduğu bu zorlu süreçte devletimizin, ordumuzun yanında olduğumuzu sadece konuşarak değil, yaptığımız ve yapacağımız işin kalitesini de artırarak uluslararası alanda başarılı olacak çalışmaları yapmaya devam ediyoruz. Ülkemize moral değerler noktasında mutluluklar yaşatmak bizlerin en asil görevlerindendir. 
Kıymetli kardeşlerim, bizlere bu, du bu uğurda desteklerini esirgemeyen, her anlamda yanımızda olan Sayın Cumhurbaşkanımız Recep Tayyip Erdoğan Beyefendi'ye, Sayın Başbakanımız Sayın Binali Yıldırım Beyefendi'ye, Sayın Gençlik ve Spor Bakanımız Doktor Aşkın Osman Aşkın Bak Beyefendi'ye şükranlarımızı sunuyorum. Değerli antrenör kardeşlerim, sizlerin bu değerli gayemizde en önde ve en çok emek harcayanlar olduğunu bilmekte ve görmekteyim. Bu değerli klinik vesilesiyle yüzmenin geleceğini inşa etmeye ve başarılar kazanacak yüzücülerimizi yetiştirecek olan sizlere kısa birkaç bilgi verip değerli konuşmacımızı sizlerle birlikte dinlemeye yanınızda kalarak devam edeceğim. Bu başarılı organizasyon için TF çalışanlarımıza ve eğitim kurulumuza da huzurunuzda tekrar teşekkür eder ve sevgimi yolluyorum. Değerli arkadaşlarım, 2020 olimpiyatları koordinasyon ekibimizle toplantılarımız sonucu çok kıymetli bir kriterler zinciri hazırlamış bulunmaktayız. Bu kriterler vesilesiyle milli takım imkanlarından yararlanacaklar. Üç gruba ayrılmış ve her bölüm için ayrı ayrı imkanlar tanımlanmıştır. Bu imkanlar arasında kamp, yarış, antrenman esnasında kullanılması gereken spesifik ihtiyaçlar federasyonumuz tarafından karşılanmış ve karşılanmaya da devam edecektir. Türkiye Olimpiyat Hazırlık Merkezlerimiz yeniden ayrıntılı bir şekilde düzenlenmiş, kriterleri Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonu sayfasından da yayınlanmıştır. Bu konuda birinci e, önceliğimiz, tohumu olan katkı sağlayan kulüplerimle uyumlu çalışma imkanlar yaratmak olmuştur. 11-12 yaş projemiz tüm hızıyla devam ediyor. Altyapımız içinde performans takip sistemini e, bakanlığımızla koordineli şekilde hayata geçirmeye başladık ve devam ettiriyoruz. Eğitim kurslarımız Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonu tarafından yapılmaya ve başarılı şekilde devam etmeye devam ediyor. Hakem kurslarımız da aynı şekilde devam etmektedir. Üsküp, Selanik yarışlarımız tabanı geniş tutmak ve devamlılığı sağlamak adına hayata geçirilmiştir. İngilizce dil kursumuz da hayata geçmiştir ve bundan da yararlanmaktasınız. Yüzme kütüphanemiz çok hacimli ve zor bir iş olmasına rağmen eğitim kurulunun çalışmaları vesilesiyle şekillenmeye başlanmıştır. Yakın zamanda sizlerin hizmetine sunulacak olan kütüphanemizin haberlerini bir kez daha yenilemiş olayım huzurunuzda. Kıymetli kardeşlerim, kıymetli antrenör arkadaşlarım, her şeyin en, güle, en güzeli siz antrenör kardeşlerim için. Her şeyin en güzeli Türkiye Yüzme Federasyonu ailesi için. Her şeyin en güzeli güçlü ve büyük Türkiye için. Hepinize katılımızdan dolayı teşekkür ediyor, saygılar sunuyorum. Sayın Başkanımıza teşekkür ediyoruz konuşmasından dolayı. Şimdi değerli misafirlerimiz Sayın Fina As Başkanı Dale Neuberger kürsüye davet ediyorum konuşmasını yapmak üzere. Alkışlarınızla. Good afternoon to all of you, and I extend the welcome of uh, FINA President, Dr. Julio Maglioni, to all of you in attendance this afternoon. It is my great pleasure to see a room filled with coaches who are interested in additional education, additional information, and who want to be able to deliver services to athletes in a better way. I think this is the largest FINA development clinic, certainly of 2018, but over the last five years, there has not been a single development clinic as large as this. And I congratulate you on being in attendance today and through the weekend. I'm also very excited to see so many female coaches in the room. And this is a very good development for our sport. And I'm very happy that so many women are in the room, in addition to the male coaches. I think you're going to have a great experience. Uh, Coach Chris Martin has extensive experience in the United States. 
coached his first Olympic gold medalist 26 years ago at the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Games, Nelson Diebel, and has continued to coach not only in the United States, but in with British swimming and in Scotland, and most recently in China. So he brings an international approach and can give you a perspective that is truly international and not just from one part of the world. I think you are going to enjoy this very much. I want to extend my appreciation to President Yeltsin for his leadership. We began to discuss this clinic last July, and we said it was a great opportunity for Turkish Swimming Federation to be a, a, a part of FINA and to be supportive of FINA, and also to be able to bring development opportunities to the Federation and to coaches, again, not only in swimming, but through the other disciplines. You have incredible opportunities for success here in Turkey. We are always uh, amazed at the energy and the enthusiasm. It's evident everywhere in Istanbul, fantastic city, and throughout, throughout Turkey. And with your population of 80 million people, the opportunity for success, I think, is close and is on the near horizon. So I thank you, I thank the Turkish Swimming Federation and to the, I think, 10 staff members who've done a great job in organizing this clinic and for the leadership that you've shown and all that you are bringing to, uh, to our sport and in service to our athletes. I hope you have a great, uh, a great weekend. It's an exciting time, much to do. Um, LEN Championships this summer, um, World Championships in 2019 in Korea, Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. Much to do, many opportunities, and I wish you great success and thank you very much for your participation. You've shown the energy and enthusiasm and drive that is present in Turkey and in Turkish swimming, and I know this is going to be a great success. Thank you very much. FINA AS Başkanımıza teşekkür ediyoruz ve artık eğitim zamanı diyoruz. Sayın eğitmenimiz, FINA eğitmenimiz, Chris Martin'i artık buraya davet ediyoruz. Büyük bir alkışla tabii. Uh, thank you all for coming. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here in front of all kinds of people who want to get better at being co at whoop, uh, who want to get better at being coaches. I love swimming more than anything else in my life, and I especially love coaching. Tonight, I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about coaching. I'm going to talk about talent, the talent of your swimmers, and I'm going to talk about the managing of that talent. I'm going to do that by telling a little bit of my own story, <clears throat> how I got into this wonderful sport, uh, and how I sort of learned from a lot of people who knew, who knew more than me. Uh, and through that story, I want to try to convince you, I feel like this is my job, my job is to convince you that almost each and every one of you can be a, not just a good coach, but a great coach. I absolutely believe that. It's not always just about the training, and I absolutely uh, stand by what Murat said. Uh, great coaches change people's lives, not just the, uh, their, own, their lives, but the lives of their swimmers, the lives of their swimmers' families, and the whole future generations that come by that. So I'm a big believer in that. I'm hoping that I can convince you to love swimming as much as I do uh, and to do it even better. So without further ado, 
Uh, let's get going. When we think about coaching, um, we usually arrive at this in, in several different pathways. Many of us started out as athletes and were swimmers. Some of us just maybe picked up a book or watched someone else do it, but a lot of what we do reflects on what was done to us. When I was a swimmer, I had a really hard coach. He made us work really hard, so I'd come at it from the view that hard work is an important part of it. When you first start out coaching, you take a lot of that with you. And it, the, the farther along you go in being a coach and doing it better, you start to see that there are other ways of doing things. And this is a theme that I'll come back to uh, over the course of all of my talks, is that the, one of the most important things is we can never get bogged down in any one thing that we know and close our minds off to other things that we might learn. Uh, we coached based on our outlook on things. I've coached in three different countries, each for a long period of time. And I realize that culture matters. Uh, we bring with us to the task of coaching the culture that we grew up in, the culture that surrounds us, and <clears throat> the, the smart coaches, good coaches, will take both the culture of themselves and the cultures of their athletes and turn that into a focus that will make their swimmers better. You will have ways of motivating children, kids, young adults, and senior athletes that will be uh, relevant and germane to Turkey. Copying what I do or some other more famous coach does in the United States or the UK or China or anywhere else will not have the same effectiveness as your Turkish approach. I do a lot of, a lot of uh, coaching of coaches and what I tell them is that after a certain point, after a very, very short time of you working with your kids, you will become the expert on your athletes. You may not yet, and I use the word yet, know as much about training and physiology as the next guy, and I know that you're, you're in the process of learning those things, but you start out from a position that you are the expert on your own swimmer. And that is a super important thing. Uh, now, we coach the swimmers that are in front of us and to the goals that motivate us. When I work with coaches, I always ask the first thing is, why are you doing this? What is the reason that you coach? Some people throw their hands up, I want to win medals. Some people coach, I want to have a lot of kids and get rich. Some people coach because someone they knew did a good job with them and motivated them. That's kind of why I do it. But in understanding why you want to be a coach, that will inform you on how you are coaching. And again, if you can step a little bit outside of your experience, you'll become much more effective. Now, a, uh, a little bit about my coaching life. For the first 15 years of my coaching, I coached in the United States. For the next 14 years after that, I coached in the UK. And for five years after that, I coached in uh, the People's Republic of China. Three hugely different experiences. From those three experiences, I learned a lot, a lot of different things. I learned a lot of different approaches. 
And I'm going to talk about that with you all and see how by, uh, by understanding how different countries make different approaches to things, you'll start to figure out the Turkish approach that's going to work the best for you all. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about my experience in the United States. In America, coaching is multipolar. And by that I mean almost everyone does something different. There are coaches that only coach open water swimmers. There are coaches that have a tendency to coach endurance swimmers. There's a lot of coaches that only coach sprint swimmers. Now, this has really worked well for the United States because being an open market kind of place, the cream rises to the top and we can pick from the people who are successful at each individual thing they do. This, in a way, not in a way, this is a good thing. Now, a lot of times when uh, federations and nations are trying to build themselves up, they try to uh, impose on the coaches one universal monolithic way of doing things. Am I okay in there? <laughs> okay. I'm checking with the interpreter that he's, uh, he's getting the words. Now, I found in my experience that this is not a successful way to go. To me, coaching is like cooking food. It's like being a chef. People always ask me, Chris, coaching, is it like, is it science? Is it all about the training? Or is it an art form? And I say, mm, a there's definitely both of those things are involved. But for me, it's almost like being a chef. And the mistake people can make is to try to learn one recipe and do it over and over and over again. That doesn't seem to work out too well. Better is to learn, and what we're going to you know, talk about some this weekend, better is to learn all about the ingredients, all about the heat, all about all the different things that go into making uh, a beginning athlete, a middle athlete, and a, and, a, and, a, and a senior athlete. And then each one of you can learn, can develop your own style, your own knowledge, most importantly, in the direction that you want to go. So in America, the upper levels of development are closely tied to scholastic schedules. School swimming is a big thing in the United States. And we have changed our way of coaching, changed our way of training, even made the schedules of when our meets and competitions are to fit that reality. Now the difference is though we have all different kinds of schools. Because of that, there is no one size fits all orthodoxy in the highest levels of, of, of the US team. When I've, I went with the national team six or seven times when I was very young and I was amazed that the people on one side were as different from the people of the other side depending on what part of the country they lived, wherever. Uh, and this is one of the strengths of American swimming. Now, as one does, you get, and, and I am no different, especially when I was a young coach, I thought, okay, this worked pretty well. Got people to the world level, got people to the Olympics, had someone win the Olympics. This is the way to do things. Now, I found out differently there's much more to life than what I knew 
uh, as a 30-year-old. Next, um, I moved to the United Kingdom, to Scotland to coach. Uh, but I kind of had two roles. I had to coach a group, but I also had to be what they call a national coach and develop coaches as well. And from that experience and, and meeting initial resistance from people, I started to learn uh, how you bring people to the task instead of taking the task to people. The thing that works best, I think, and I think you all are in a great position for this, is that um, as a coach, you need to sign, up, sign yourself up to your own goals, acquire the ideas you're going to need to reach those goals, and then learn the strategies of work and application that will take you to where you want to go. Um, if you do that, you'll do better, without question. If, if someone comes in and people who had, had done my job before me had tried to go into a place, tell everyone, this is how you have to do it, everyone has to train a certain way, everyone has to train a certain time, and it didn't work that well. So, um, and from what I see from your program as it's going now, I could not be more excited for you. You know, I've, I've met Arkan and listened to some of the things that, he's, that he seems to have planned for you all, and I absolutely believe this is the way to go to have success. For me, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the results of having an open pathway and having shared goals, but in managing people's uh, experience and ideas were not only greater success, but it opened me up to learning even more about the different methodologies of coaching uh, and training, and I'm going to talk about those over time, um, that I continued to grow and develop as a coach, and I started to realize how much I didn't know. And as soon as I find out that I don't know something, I want to try my best to figure out what it is. So, that took me on the journey that I'm going to talk to you guys about, which is um, LTAD, which is Long-Term Athlete Development. Um, the reason I like to talk about that is because it is super important that you realize the stage of the athlete that you are working with. What your goals are for that athlete, both in a certain season and even for a certain competition, but most importantly, for their entire career. The world is littered with people that have developed fast age group swimmers who never go on to the even sometimes the high national level but not to the, net, the international and Olympic level. And I've found that the main reason that that does not happen is that um, people don't look at the process in a long arc of progress. What needs to happen is you have to think about the process from lessons all the way up to the Olympic Games and even farther than that to a sustained career that's going to last. Only if you think about the process from cradle to grave and where you are in that process, where the athlete is in that process, can you do the most effective job and do right by your swimmer and give them a chance 
to be the best possible swimmer um, they can be. If you look at the bottom of that slide, um, most of the scientific papers that you see on long-term athlete development in every sport, and certainly in the sport of swimming, divide the process up into those parts that are there. The first part being fundamental development. And I'll talk about that shortly. The second stage, once you've learned the fundamentals and the movements that, that, re, that underpin the strokes, you move on to learning to train. And then training to train, training to compete, and training to win. Now, when you think about it that way, then the process makes physiology, dry land, periodization part of a bigger scheme, part of a bigger process, a bigger continuum. The problem lies if you try to jump some of those stages. All of a sudden, there'll be some kid who has physiological development a little bit ahead of his or her peers and is able to maybe qualify for uh, a level or a step, a step beyond. And then people put senior training on top of an age grouper. This doesn't usually work out so well. So I warn you and ask you, start to learn, and I'm sure you will be, uh, well, you'll certainly be, talk, talk, we will certainly talk about it over the course of the weekend, but in the things that you read and study, uh, you need to be aware of long-term athlete development um, and how that affects both your coaching and your swimmers. Um, Again, going back to my story, in the middle of the UK, having to explain this to other coaches and working with people in other sports who also had to uh, deal with, with, with these concepts, I started to learn even more. Uh, and some of the things I learned... were hugely effective um, to me, and I'm sure they will be to you. And we will talk about some of those. And I call this European style physiology. Uh, because I've got to tell you, in the United States, the amount of coaches that actually know and understand physiology is not as high as you might think. Not at all. Literally, they could not fill this room. And we have a lot of coaches. Uh, and like I said, part of our success or the success of the U.S. team is because there's always someone who can get someone to the high level. But if we can, and I know that we can, get everyone here to understand physio physiology and and what it means to actually develop an athlete, you all could take the world by storm. Um, the first sort of really new thing that I learned over there that I will talk about later is also uh, heart rate variability and understanding, and, and that's sort of a metaphor for understanding the recovery process of swimmers and athletes in general and how important it is uh, when you're doing your training to understand how much work goes into a swimmer, if that suppresses them, how long it suppresses them, and how much they're going to bounce back from that. Uh, and that can really help you understand the, uh, the parameters, and I call them the waves, of a child's development 
and how you can ride those waves to success. And then one of the most important things that, I, that I've really started to learn and almost in my latest years is that the thing that separates learning, proficiency, and mastery into those three levels, I think, are, are three things. Uh, the perception, awareness, and breathing. And what I mean that is perception, awareness of the water, perception, awareness of the organism, the athlete itself, and pretty fundamentally, how you perceive the water and your awareness of the water and yourself is going to affect your breathing and that's going to affect everything. We will talk about that and I think, you know, maybe some people are going to get their minds blown a little bit, but I think that's where the future lies. Now, at the top of that slide, and I think this is the most important idea, uh, and I think the future of swimming is, has a lot to do with this, is the idea of swimming as a complex system, an organic system. What you're doing when you're training an athlete is you are taking all of their subsystems and sort of knotting them together and pushing them upwards and forwards, almost like planting a tree and watching it grow. It is not like forging a piece of steel. And that's what a lot of people think. If I do a lot of this training and a lot of this, uh, only the physiology, and put it on hard and fast, I'll make something that's very strong. But what I think is, even steel breaks. Plastic certainly does. But when you think about it, organic structures that grow and change and work within each other, physiologically, psychologically, and develop slowly over time, you get an athlete that can bend in the stresses like a tree br bends in the wind and becomes very, very much stronger. Now, some of the ideas that underpin the things that I talk about, I've listed some of the, th some of the books that um, I think are interesting for people to read. I won't talk about them too much, but um, for every age group parent, and for every young swimmer and for every new coach, I recommend that they understand the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset. Uh, and I will talk about that tomorrow a little bit, but the general idea is if you have a fixed mindset and you are only focused on the stopwatch and the time, you will only get so far. If you can focus on what the scientists call ruthless incremental improvement, one, I was gonna say one day at a time, but one effort at a time, your potential for development is nearly unlimited. Coaches, I also recommend understanding a little bit of uh, basic neuroscience and how the brain works, how our brain tries to trick us into doing less, into perceiving less, and into making everything repetitive and safe. If we can break that down, um, we can better motivate kids to understand themselves uh, and move faster. Um, 
finally in my little journey there, uh, I thought I had learned a, enough or a, a, a lot more that I, I could go, come back to physiology. And I wanted to see if, um, the way I would put it is, kids were still kids. If I trained them to a certain point, did the physiology still work? And it, it certainly does. So I went to China, uh, and I got a group of younger swimmers and developed them to the world level. I had 30 kids, maybe ages 13 to 15, and I drove them to... Um, Two of them got to Rio. Uh, neither of them got any medals, but they swam pretty well. Um, and I learned even more that I hope to pass on to you. And the first one is, is that the future is putting teaching and training together as we move forward. It is not going to be about simply teaching someone butterfly or backstroke when they're seven, pushing them up and down the pool a few million times when they're 14, and thinking that person's going to be an Olympic champion. It doesn't necessarily work that way. When we put uh, teaching and training together, the athletes m learn more about the water learn more about themselves and are able to develop not only at a quicker rate but over a longer time frame almost you know to their physical limitations the third thing I learned in my uh, China experience that I'd like to share with you is is that um, I think we need to move past the linear expectations of biomechanics and what I call that is uh, angle swimming and we need to take into consideration how the body actually works and when we consider that and put that together with the physiology we know I think we can develop talent even faster Uh, now, I have, um, well, actually, before that, I'd like to do a little experiment here, if I could. Imagine that you're in a room. The room has no windows. It's just four solid walls. There are no doors. There's no way out of this room. The only thing that's in the room is a hole in the ceiling. Down that hole is a rope. Can everybody imagine that? I always call it like a wrestling room. In the United States, when we have wrestling, we have little rooms like that so they can bang up against the walls. I don't know if you have anything similar to that in Turkey. But have that in your imagination. All of a sudden, the room catches on fire. And the only way out is climbing the rope. Now I ask you, your life depends on it. How are you going to go up that rope? Are you going to do this? I don't think so. You're going to go up the rope like this. Now, my favorite shot of the Olympics in swimming is when they have that camera underwater and it goes along underneath the swimmers. And I don't know about you. But what I see when that camera's going along the swimmers is something that looks a lot more like this than, what? than like this.
Think about that for a minute. Why is that? I suspect it's because back in the 1950s or 60s, when we started drawing stroke books, we took a three-dimensional thing and turned it into a two-dimensional representation. And now, in terms of the movements that underpin stroke development, we're going back to understanding how the body works. Along those lines, and I'll talk about it when I, when I, when I get to what I call quality of movement, think about this well. This is something you can try yourself. We have our hands that are attached to our arms and they evolve to feed us so that we can put food in our mouths. When our arms are within the line of sight, when my eyes can hold on to that, my arms will be very strong. Test it yourselves when we have a little break. The minute they come out of my sight line, they're far, far weaker. I could get a volunteer. Anybody want to volunteer and come, and come up? Now, I'm going to ask her to put her hand straight over her head. Like this. Now, push against me. She can't. She's very weak. But as soon as, a little farther, now push. Now push. Once her hands get stronger than that, she gets much, much stronger. That's a key thing. Pulling this way versus pulling this way. And that's because we have to consider... We have to consider exactly how the body works and not just make up movements uh, because we think they are drag reducers. Okay, so for me, there are four training aspects that I think are important to making a great swimmer. Metabolic processes, swimming technique, quality of movement, and what I call talent. Now, ooh, taking them one at a time, we're starting with technique. Now, as I just showed you, I don't think enough of us really consider how the body actually works. And I think what the biomechanists call body angles are kind of rubbish. That may be a little controversial to some of you. But if you're telling your, your, your athlete to put their hands in at 45 degrees or 52 degrees or in this position, you need to understand, human beings don't know that. Your body doesn't know 45 degrees. We, we made up 45 degrees. Human beings just know how to move. It's just like when you tell them to go 26-4. Your, your brain doesn't know 26-4. Eventually, it will know 26-4 because it will get a feeling that happens at 26-4. And if you do that enough times, it'll be like, oh, every time that clown coach of mine says 26-4, I, I got to make, make it feel like this. But it doesn't know 26-4. Just like it doesn't know 45 degrees. So what we have to do instead is figure out what angle works the best for your swimmers. So the things you need to consider are the rules of the stroke. 
And you want to consider uh, what I call the body ratios. And from that, you're going to make movements, which is then going to make your particular stroke. Now, I, I met Arkan yesterday for the first time. And uh, I can't remember if it was he or, Anna, uh, he or Hannah asked, Chris, do you, do you know what stroke he swam? And I looked at him and I said, mm, back and fly. And I was dead right. And I had never met him before. Now, some of that is a little bit obvious. But it was because I saw his size. He was tall. I saw that he had a longer torso. His legs were a little bit pigeon-toed. And his legs were relatively shorter than his torso for his height. If he looked a bit different, I would have said sprint freestyle, distance freestyle, breaststroke. Now... Those, I'm not saying that your, your, your, uh, your body shape is your destiny. But a good coach can make those things certainly a little bit more of your desti destiny and can certainly construct a stroke that will be better than, the, than just some random stroke you see in a book. Or even more better than just copying the stroke of someone who happens to be the best swimmer in the world or you know someone that you see on TV and that's what I really want to get across to you make the best stroke that you can the best technique will be individual to each athlete is everybody okay with that? I should have said in the beginning, if anyone wants to ask me a question as we go along, please throw up your hand. And I think that statement, those statements were hard enough that if anyone wants to challenge me on that or ask questions, now is the time. Anyone? Yes, sir. Either come up or say what you need to say. Go ahead. All right. Uh, where's Hannah? Or, or someone? Or they'll get her. Because I do think this is very important. This may be the most important thing we talk about. Oh, okay. Go ahead. That's good. Okay, shoot. Go ahead. Yes. Adı Marda, hoş geldiniz. I can't hear him. Sorry. Okay, go ahead again. Hoş geldiniz. Adı Marda. Hi Arda. Welcome to Turkey. Uh, öncelikle sormak istediğim soru şu. Vücut tipinden bahsettiniz. Küçük yaşlardaki bir sporcunun vücut tipinin e, yüzmede belirleyici faktör olduğundan bahsettiniz. Üzerinden geçtiniz. Yalnızca tabii ki de tek faktör olmadığını savunuyorsunuz. Bu konuda şunu söylemek istiyorum. Sormak istiyorum kusura bakmayın. Sorum şu. Küçük yaşlarda vücut tipine uygun spor branşı seçimi konusunda Yüzme olan yatkınlıkları nasıl görebiliriz? Birinci soru. İkinci soru. Herhangi bir boy skalası bu konuda var mıdır? Sizin tercihleriniz ya da bu tecrübeleriniz, bütün tamam. tecrübeleriniz ışığında. Üçüncü soru da şu. Bir insanı yalnızca... Biraz da yukarı. Bir insanı... 
Continue. Yeah. Bir insanın 7 yaşında ya da 6 yaşında yalnızca mm-hmm. fiziksel vücut tipine uygun olarak yüzmeye yönlendirmek ne kadar doğru? Teşekkür ederim. Okay. Great question. Fabulous question. But I do think there's an answer. Again, I'm going to go back to my metaphor for growing a plant. At six or seven, you can't tell the future of how they're going to develop. All right? But there are certain things that you can tell. Um, what I'm saying about the body types as a determining factor is it is a big factor. It's not the whole factor. And certainly at six or seven, you won't know exactly how they're going to develop. I cheat a little bit and look at their parents. <laughs> but what you want to do is you want to work with all four strokes to try to get hints on how they will develop. So for example, at six or seven, you may see the turned feet of a breaststroker, but you may not. Certainly, the, the golden ratio has to do with, it's not how tall they are. It's not a whole height factor. But whatever is your height, you're going to look at the ratio of the torso to your whole height, the ratio of your leg limb leg limb length to your whole height and also the length of your arms compared to your whole height so if your arms are relatively short your butterfly will be different than if your arms are very very long the vibration of your axial skeleton and we will talk about that tomorrow will be different the easiest way to explain that is when you see people going underwater in backstroke or even in fly, if they have a long-limbed body, the waves, the body waves are longer. If they have uh, sort of shorter legs and a shorter torso, you see more of this kind of oscillation. Now you can tell these things at a fairly early age and start to work with it. And as they grow and change, you may have to change the way you do things. When we talk about the four strokes tomorrow, you know, breaststroke, when you're getting your center of mass kind of up and over the water, if your legs are really, really long, and your torso is really, really short, that'll be a different arm motion than if it's the other way around. That's all I'm saying. Does everyone kind of get that? Is that an okay answer? Fantastic. Anyone else want to ask me anything else about that before I keep going? Okay. All right. So, continuing on with what I said and and looking at the movements no, looking at the technique as being a result of the body of the athlete that you're working with that made me make technique a subset of what I'm calling quality of movement. So now, especially after working with young kids again for the second time in my life, I started to see that to make real champions, it's really about three things. Quality of movement, which takes in the idea that we used to call technique. Talent and I'll get to what that is in a minute, and the metabolic processes that we all know. Now, think about it for a second. And I'm speaking to you, 
coaches from Turkey. That's only three things. That's three areas. There's a lot of information in those areas, but, you know, I think anyone can learn it. Now, moving on. Talent. This is the thing. Everybody sees a great swimmer, and they're like, why are they so much better than everybody else? How many of you have seen someone on TV and you just think, how are they doing that? Everybody's had that feeling. I know I used to have. Well, to me, after looking at video for years and years and years, the greatest swimmers do two things better than everyone else. Two things. One is they make wave-like patterns in their body when they move. And that, I'm trying to think how to explain that. You, you can almost see the ripples go down within their body when they move. Each movement in the, what the, what the, um, what the scientists call the kinetic chain, each one fires in a sequence as they go down the body. That's what talented people do. One of the, and, and I think that we can stimulate that even in younger kids. And the way that I think that is done is to wake up a system called the fascia system. I hope he warned you about that word that I was going to say it. <laughs> uh, the fascial system, if you go to the butcher and you buy a piece of meat, you see that white stuff on the outside? That's the fascia between the muscles. And I think that 21st century lifestyle has made a lot of those things go to sleep. And it takes a lot for our whole body to wake up. And that if we can make new and, and better, more organic exercises, and also have an approach to the way people move that's more dynamic, we can wake up more of that and we can get better at one of the 50% of what makes talent. The second thing is that talented swimmers have a high perception about the water and their body in the water. That sounds just like words, doesn't it? I'm going to make that real. How many of you coach really little kids? Hands up. Small ones. Thank you. Great. Now, what is the hardest thing for them to learn? Breathing. Would you say that? Now, first, do you know why that is? It's because we evolved out of the water. The brain doesn't really like being there. And in their first primary experience, there will be defensive brain mechanisms that come into play. Uh, I run a lesson program now, and I deal with this every day. The human being likes to be either in this position, above the water. That's, that's what it wants most of all. If it has to, it'll do this. <sighs> under the water. But what it doesn't like is this position right at the water level. Because a signal goes back to your brain and says, don't be here. Now think about that. So you will see, and I've had Olympic level athletes 
that if you really slow motion their stroke all the way down low, when they reach their arms forward in freestyle, you will see that they're not really engaging with the water infinitesimally or more. They'll be pushing themselves up so that their mouth can just clear that way. I mean, great swimmers. You look at some great swimmers. The reason I'm telling you that is because you all, all those hands that went up with teaching the little ones, you can make the difference between a champion and an almost champion by getting the, the, the, the, the young child, the athlete, to be better at breathing. To relax when they're in that water. And that relationship they're going to have with the water is going to last them forever. I really need you to think about that because that's as true as it gets. Now, the talented athletes, and it's not an all for on thing, it's not 100% or 0%, but the, the greatest athletes, they, they deal with that and when they're in those positions in whatever stroke they're in, they can breathe more normally. Very few swimmers can just absolutely engage with the water 100%. But those that are better, when they're in that, what I call that brain defensive position, they're more calm, they can make better movements, they can do number one with less stress, and also they can then perceive all the different things that are happening within their body. Now I'm going to put this out to questions again. I hope I haven't freaked anybody out too hard yet. Anyone want to ask me about that? No? Usually this is when people start shouting at me. Sir, go ahead. I got the, I got the thing he's on now. Merhabalar. Yalaba'dan katılıyoruz. Yes, now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Merhaba. İsmim İlhan İleri. E, nefesle ilgili bahsetmiştiniz ama bu rahat nefes alma egzersizleri veya nefes almada sakin olma egzersizleri ne tip egzersizler olabilir mesela? Bununla ilgili birkaç örnek alabilir miyiz? Sure. With the little ones, one of the things I try to do is uh, crocodile breathing where with the first little ones, and I even get in with them if I have to, and I will make them open their mouth and let the, let the, water, run, let the water go over their tongue and just be there. I say, you're a crocodile. And then I sometimes pretend that I get a little water in my mouth. I go, <coughs> and then I laugh, and then we just look at them some more. And then they do that. And you'd be amazed. You know, pretty soon they get over the idea, yeah, I'm standing. And I do this in shallow water where they can stand. But they quick, well, not quickly, but in a few weeks, they learn that there's nothing super stressful about having their mouth partly in and partly out. 
Another good one is for them to blow a ping pong ball. Table tennis, you know table tennis? Blow a ping pong ball along the, the water surface. Now this is for the youngest, youngest, youngest ones. Okay? But the idea is at the first stage, you are making talent. You are creating a possible future champion. If you can, instead of trying to make some movement that you saw in a book, if you can get that athlete, that swimmer, to be more relaxed with breathing and to actually exhale instead of doing what, and you watch this, what I'm going to show you is what 90% of your swimmers do. Stop me if you think I'm wrong. They do this. Yeah? That's all your swimmers, isn't it? Think about it. We're in the year 2017. And people still don't exhale under the water like they're supposed to. Why not? Because the first coach, the first teachers, you know, could spend more time on that. So the first person who gets that done, you know, championships are sure to follow. One more time for the question, because after that I'm going to get to the, what I call the, the, the boring stuff, but the stuff that you're going to want to know is the metabolic processes. But Perceptions, they are important. Okay, and then the stuff you sort of know. All right, the stuff you know is the metabolic processes, and they are important. You cannot make a champion without them. So I'm not poo-pooing them in any way. And I, yes, I am one of these coaches that has worked children very, very hard for them to have success. And they have had that success. Um, but I see that there's more to it than that. But for me, the metabolic processes mainly have three sections. Volume. And there is a certain, I, I do believe, there is a certain amount of volume depending on what events you are going to swim. Uh, it has to be done in the LTAD framework. The, you okay? Yeah. It has to be done within that framework. But there are volumes which if you do not achieve them at a certain point in your life, you will not get to where you want to go. Second part, heart rate, hormones, and energy systems. Uh, that's pretty much just how it sounds. Energy systems are physiological processes that fuel our body. We will talk about them later. Uh, and they work both concurrently and within stages. You must consider that when you're writing practices, when you're planning a season, um, when you're doing everything. Uh, hormones, where you are in your hormonal growth state will decide those decisions that you make about energy systems. And since you've all seen the handouts for what we're going to talk about uh, later, you know, you, you'll see what I'm talking about, so we'll get to that. And then the heart rate is, until we get machines that may someday tell us what's happening inside of ourselves in real time, uh, the heart rate is, I think, the best um, indeterminate measure of what's happening with our energy systems. You know, I've used heart rate variability and lactate testing to a large, large extent. But uh, I think you can do a whole lot just by monitoring heart rate when people are swimming, when they're done, and the variability from day to day uh, and learn a lot about how they're doing. 
And then the third part of the metabolic process is, of course, intensity, stress, and recovery. So you've got your energy systems, you know how old the athlete is, you know what their hormonal state, state is, you know the kind of work that you are going to do with them, you know how to monitor their heart rate to check for what energy systems that are being engaged uh, and when, and then finally, you decide how fast you want them to swim every day, how many days in a row you want them to swim that fast, the stress it's going to put on their body at the different stages of their life, and how much recovery is going to be required for their development to continue and for them to improve um, without crashing into an overtraining state. Okay, uh, I'm a believer in, um, in the kind of two measure, the, the two system measurement of energy systems. That at, at each point in an athlete's development, and when I say each point, I don't just mean each year, but I mean each season, that they will have uh, a capacity ex aspect to either their aerobic or anaerobic current system, and they will also have a strength or power aspect. All right, and, and most of that is, um, well, let's put it this way, yeah. So the capacity, and think about this, in terms of your aerobic ability and your anaerobic ability, you will have a capacity, and that is the maximum amount of energy that has been put into your body through training, through practice. The way I like to describe it is, you have two gas tanks. I'm big on metaphors, sorry about that. So imagine you have, um, you know, your aerobic gas tank, which is like petrol or gasoline and it burns at that rate, and it's a, giant, it's a big gas tank. And then also, you have your anaerobic gas tank, which is a little bit smaller, but it burns like jet fuel. Okay, so the capacity of each one of those is how big is your tank, and how much is in it. Okay, and then the strength or power means the ability to provide that energy within a specific unit of time, okay? So what that means is, sticking with my little metaphor here, if you have the two gas tanks, it's the novels, nozzles, sorry, <laughs> nozzles where it comes out. For example, if you have your anaerobic gas tank and you're swimming a 50 free, or 100 free, that nozzle needs to be big and wide so that it can all come out at once. If you're swimming a longer race, you know, you have to make sure that your nozzle's the right side, but you really want to make sure that it's filled up with this kind of energy and also this kind of energy for the beginning and the end of the race and that it can all come out at the right time. How did I do with that analogy? You know why I thought of it? I, I will tell you, the, the, the, the big devotees of this way of thinking are two very good friends of mine, Dr. Jan Olbrecht from Belgium and Dr. Ernie McGlisho from the United States. And whenever these guys talk, coaches are like, oh, I don't get it. I used to be the same way. So I, after years of them explaining to me, this was the best way I could try to get it across. 
and I hope that's somewhat helpful. Um, and you can ask me that. I, I sort of stole this idea from an Italian, this way of explaining it from an Italian coach that I heard once who said it and it really made sense to me, but I've forgotten his name. It was so long ago. Does anyone ask anything about, about uh, the metabolic processes here? We okay to go on? All right. Here's some things that are, you, you may need to know. Now, what I put up there, in reverse order, these are the most aerobically talented animals on planet Earth. Number one is the camel. Number two is the ostrich. Then sled dogs, antelopes, humans, and horses. That's right. We are ahead of horses. If you drop me and a horse into an opposite ends of the Gobi Desert, I will eat that horse. And I had no food, of course because we are that aerobically talented. Now, in terms of the history of swimming, it was probably in the middle to late 1960s that we started to realize that. Before that, before that first, what I call the aerobic renaissance that lasted from the 60s to the 80s, we swam basically on body movements and feel. And then we found the aerobic engine. And we mined the daylights out of it. And that is when the swimming times improved to a huge amount. Now I'm mentioning that because um, we have sort of gotten almost to the limits of that. we got to the limits of how much pure aerobic energy we could spend in both training and a race. And I think we've come full circle where we're now going to think about how the body moves and also how to be better at managing um, all of our energy systems at the same time. And why I mention this is because overtraining, and I'm sure some of you have had this point where your kids just can't get any better. Overtraining is usually the result of too much high aerobic strength work and that is threshold intensity volume and VO2 max. If you do too much of those without enough recovery, your athlete falls over a cliff. It causes too much consumption of muscle glycogen and the reserves that your body has just to keep going. I'm sure as you all know, you know, when you're burning aerobic energy, it's oxygen. You're taking it right out of the air, putting it into your system and moving. When it's anaerobic, you know, you're burning your breakfast. If you don't get the mixture right, if you rob too much, too many times in a row without thinking about it, you, um, you have the risk of overtraining. So, after all that, you know, I think the talent is a high perception of water in the body, and I think it's the most important thing to train. I think those three things interact with each other and that they are so close together even though we can't measure perception as well as we can measure the metabolic processes and to a certain extent we can measure the quality of movement because like I showed with uh, that 
young woman who came up here, you can feel if the quality of movement is superior. Perception is a little bit of the gray area. But they are the three most important things in terms of managing talent. All right, I'm going to show you a picture too if I can. All right, if I do this right, the video should play. Have a look at this. That little girl in the front, at that time she was only 13. Um, but she ended up going 2 minutes 10. Point one and 200 meter IM and 433, maybe 208 and fly. The girl behind her, um, she's maybe 57 for butterfly. In a few years, this is when they were little ones. Those boys in the back, they became pretty good, maybe 350. That guy in the green. Now, when, it, when it's finished, I'm going to tell you what they're doing. Okay, now that exercise, that's something we call black cord. Uh, and it's designed... Sorry about that. It's designed to do what I said about waking up the fascial system. It's about stretching the muscles from the inside out. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a strict protocol. I think that's just looping. Let me stop that. Oh no. That's my gym guy. Um, sort of working with that. And the story is, is we try to expand the pelvis get it absolutely spread out and in a somewhat stressed position. And by doing that, it, it makes all the different muscles aware and moving that cord is a way of teaching them how to make waves when they move and also how to use every single muscle that's within them. And I found that to be very successful for my kids. This is a second movement that he's going to teach them. Now, the interesting thing is, this was the first year that we did that. By the end, they could do two and three chords in a band that I could hardly pull myself. Uh, and little kids were able to stretch themselves, not by pushing, but by stretching their internal muscles then to their external muscles, and then eventually to get, uh, to get distance. That guy here, he's the, he ended up becoming the strongest. There he's only about 14 or 15, but he ended up being 212 in a minute for breaststroke. This is uh, the inventor of this, and you notice how his cord is much thicker. His name is Milt Nelms. He runs, he, he runs with me. We're the founders of our uh, sort of lesson and development program. 
He works a lot with uh, the University of California, Berkeley, the women's team there. Uh, and I guess the most famous swimmer you would know that he works with a lot is Dana Vollmer, who won the 100 Butterfly in uh, uh, London. And she does a lot of this. Anyone want to ask anything about that? Yes, sir. One more with the mic. Yes, sir. Merhaba, tekrar hoş geldiniz. Thank you. Ee, video oynarken, en başından beri bütün videoları oynarken, çocuklara anlatır gibi anlatır mısınız lütfen? Ne yapılıyor orada? Bunu rica edeceğim size. Ya Video oynarken e, karşınızda bir grup olduğunu ve çocuk olduğunu düşünün. Ve onlara e, çocuklar anlatır gibi bize anlatır mısınız? Okay, I will try. And then, I know we've been here a long time. After we do this, we're going to take a short break and then come back for the finish. Okay. Um, this is the most basic exercise, the first one they learn. And we tell them to put the cord around their back and they loop one, we make it into two loops, one at each end. All right, and one is the stabilization arm. And they're gonna hold that tight to their body. On the other one, they're going to go from a standing forward position to a position where they open their pelvis up. Whoa, is that still working? Yeah, okay. Where they're gonna open their pelvis up and then they're going to stretch the cord. Well, they're not, they're going to move their body. And we tell them that inside their body, they're gonna try to make this line longer and they're going to try to make the line longer so that it does not require effort for the cord to go forward. We want them to use their inside muscles to move to make their body stretch as far as it can so that they only have to move the cord at the end. Let's see if she can do that. Okay, now what I'm looking for is, I'm looking to see, if I see her hand going like this and shaking, she's doing it wrong. If I see that the movement starts here, if I see that the movement starts here and moves outward to her arm, Okay, it's the same with him. Now, see, he's not very good at it yet. And he's not very good because he has to keep his elbow up. He, did you see how his elbow dropped into his side? That's not so good for me. I want it to stay even. 
Then I want him to turn, and then I want him to stretch all the way from here, all the way through here, in one moment, in one movement. And I want him to extend all the way through here at the same time. So at the end, it just has to move a tiny little bit. Okay? Okay. Uh, let's take a five or ten minute break. Everybody gets a ten minute break and then we'll come back for the.